So we've been in this series about uh, unleashing the Holy Spirit in our lives, and I want to start this message off with an admission. Maybe, maybe I should say it's a confession. Before Jenny and I got rid of television, we got rid of uh, a dish, or what did we have? Um, I never remember. It's... Uh, Thank you, Direct TV. Yes, that's the one. Before we got rid of that uh, to, to save money um, and went to just the streaming stuff, there was a television show that we watched regularly. And we watched it regularly for one reason, and that was to make fun of the people that were in this television show. Now, I understand that that isn't Christ like. I get it that we shouldn't do that, shouldn't make fun of people. We all can watch the planks in your own eye right now because I know you do the same thing. I don't know what show it is for you, but I know that you have that habit as well. For us, it was a program called The Bachelor, all right? The Bachelor, The Bachelorette. I am endlessly entertained by this program for a number of reasons. Number one, the nonsense drama that they create. I teach high school kids, so I am used to nonsense drama. These are supposed to be adults. These are 20, 30-year-old people, and they, the cat fights that those dudes get into, and <laughs> the claws come out, it's just ridiculous. And just to laugh at that, the actual belief that not only the people on the show have, but the legions of folks that are part of Bachelor Nation have that what's being pursued on this program is actually love. It's not love. That's the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. These people are putting the, I'm not going to go into it, but we also would keep a tally board for the phrase. If you've ever watched this show, you will know the phrase. If you haven't watched the show, or even if you have, I got a video clip. See if you can pick up on the one that you are guaranteed to hear about 30 times in every program. Can we roll this, please? Tonight on The Bachelor. Sierra's not here for the right reasons. She's not here for the right reasons. She's not here for the right reasons. Not being here for the right reasons. I'm here for the right reasons. They're not here for the right reasons. And I just, I know you're here for the right reasons. And I know she's here for the right reasons. He is not here for the right reasons. You're nervous that I'm not here for the right reasons. <laughs> Absolutely here for the right reasons. And I'm here for the right reasons. I'm here for the, for the right reasons. So. Did you pick up on what it is? I mean, it's just 30 times a show. Is he here for the right reasons? I don't know if she's here for the right reasons. Bob's not here for the right reasons, but Gary is here for the right reasons. It's so annoying. So let me bring that question to what we're talking about and ask you, why is it that you seek the Holy Spirit in your life? We talk about that and we want the Holy Spirit. Well, why? If I ask you that question, why do you want to experience the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit in your life? Do you want his supernatural presence in you for the right reasons or the wrong reasons, because there, there's both sides of this. What, what is the right reason to want the Holy Spirit? Because you want to you want to experience the fullness of God. That's the right reason to want the Holy Spirit. You want to become a better vessel for God to serve the, His church through you. That is the reason you should want the Holy Spirit. What are not good reasons? The wrong reasons. We want the Holy Spirit because we think it'll bring power and influence. If the Holy Spirit uses me, then I will become more noticeable to other people and they will come from miles around to hear me speak or to hear me or see me do whatever it is that I'm doing for my own purposes and profit. If these are the reasons that we're seeing, you know what this reminds me of? I don't know if you remember Simon the Sorcerer, Simon the Magician that confronts the, the apostles in Acts chapter 8. It's exactly what this sounds like. By the way, I don't know why that's twisted. I, I guess I was... I don't know. Okay, anyway, it's fine, but this, you can still read it, right? When Simon saw that the Spirit was given at the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered him money. He goes to the apostles and says, here's some money. Give me also this ability so that everyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. I want that power because that would be really cool. And Peter answered, may your money perish with you because you thought you could buy the gift of God with money. Well, we may not be buying the gift of God with money, but are we seeking the gift of God for money, for profit, for power, for preeminence among men? I don't know why you seek the Holy Spirit, but if you are suffering from a lack of him in your life, I would remind you of what we talked about in the very first series I did here back in September or October when we went through the More Than Word series we read in James. When you ask, you do not receive because you ask with the wrong motives that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. If you are seeking the Holy Spirit and you are not experiencing his presence in your life, perhaps that is because you have the wrong reasons. I'm going to see how many times I can work that into this sermon. Here's a test. How do we know, here's another one, if you are seeking him for the wrong reasons? Well, it's going to manifest in some ways. So you can just you can survey your own existence. Are you constantly seeking a miracle? Do you want the Holy Spirit in your life because you think if he's there, 
then I'm going to have more miracles be a part of my life and my existence. Listen, if there's nothing wrong with wanting a miracle. We all want miracles. We've all had family members or close ones, or maybe it's us. We've been going through something, and we want God to work a miracle. And there's nothing wrong with that. But there is everything wrong with wanting a miracle more than we want the will of God. You see the distinction and the difference, right? If we're wanting a miracle simply for our own sake, that isn't right. But if we're seeking a miracle so that God may be glorified, if we want his will more than anything else, then that's an appropriate understanding. Seeking the Holy Spirit, thinking it's going to lead to more miracles in our life is an indication that we have the wrong reasons for seeking him. Um, because it sounds to me a little bit like this. You remember when Satan takes the, uh, Jesus to the holy city, has him stand on the highest point of the temple? And Satan says to him, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down. Because it's written that he'll command his angels concerning you. And they'll lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Hey, you can do this and, and we'll have a miracle. Everybody will see a miracle, Jesus. And Jesus answered him, it's also written, don't put the Lord your God to the test. Are we doing that? Are we putting God to the test? I want the Holy Spirit in my life and then he will manifest and I will see miracles. Don't put God to the test. That isn't a reason to seek the Holy Spirit. You know what scripture tells you to do? It's to pursue the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And look why. You want to serve people better. I want the Holy Spirit in my life so that I am better at serving his church. I want the Holy Spirit in my life so I can love people better, like the Grossmayers. Remember them from a week or two ago? The family that forgave the killer of their daughter? I want to love like that. So I need the Holy Spirit in my life. I want to be more joyful, like Joni Erickson Tata, a woman who is immensely joyful despite having quadriplegia, chronic pain. I want, to, I want to be joyful and lead people to Christ with my joy. I need the Holy Spirit for that. I want to be more encouraging to the church around me, to the people around me. I want to lift folks up. Those are the reasons we are to seek the Holy Spirit and his power in our lives. Miracles were never an end. They were a means to an end. And we need to be mindful of that. If you are filled with the Holy Spirit, one who is faithful will understand and trust God to dole out miracles as he sees fit. God's still in the business of doing miracles. But if you are seeking the Holy Spirit simply for miraculous power, it's the wrong reason. Here's another way it manifests. We lead the Holy Spirit more than he leads us. We use the Holy Spirit as we lead our lives. I've always been uber cautious of this phrase. I just don't use it. God called me to whatever. And people say that all the time. Maybe you've said it. I'm not saying it's wrong for you to say it. But it's very interesting to me that oftentimes the spirit of God seems to be leading us exactly where we want to go that's why I get a little cautious about it. I'll use myself as an example it would be very easy for me to say well the Holy Spirit I, I thought that I might go and do other things but but God led me here to my community to to serve in Greentown and and that's why I'm here and that you know it's God's will well that could be but it also could be that when God was opening doors for me to go in a different direction, I liked the fact that I had family here, I had a good job here, my kids were happy here, I was comfortable here, and so in essence, maybe I have decided this is where I'm going to be, and I'm just going to attach God's name to it. That's why I get really uncomfortable with that phrase that God led me this. Saying that we want the Spirit to lead us is scary. And why is it scary? Because he may not lead us exactly where we want to go. And several of you know people that he has not led. We all know the apostles. The spirit of God that was in them did not lead them to places that were comfortable for them. Led them to being shipwrecked. Led them to being uh, under, under uh, threat constantly of their lives. Led them to being beaten by men around them. Led them to being imprisoned. This wasn't exactly comfortable places. And yet they found comfort in the presence of the Holy Spirit. One way we can know this if we are and we're letting the Spirit lead us and we are where we're supposed to be, consider what this body right here, Jerome Christian Church, what would this place be without you? How would it function without you? And you say, I don't understand. Well, 1 Corinthians 12 says, the reason you have the gifts of the Holy Spirit is to serve his people. It's to serve his body. It's to serve th these people around you. That is why you have these gifts of the Holy Spirit. So, the question is, if you are truly called by him to be here, then you should be serving this community in an invaluable way. So we could ask this question. How would this building, how would this congregation, how would this church be functioning? And I'm not talking to the visitors here. I'm talking to the members. How would this place look if everyone here was as committed as you are? 
For some of you, this place would be ripping along. We'd be doing amazing things if you answered that question. Others of you, I don't know that you could say the church would even exist. If everybody in this body was as committed as you are to serving the body of Christ, what would this place look like? Are we allowing the Spirit to lead us? And then there's this. This is another way that it manifests. We want the attention. I want to be careful in how I say this because I'm not trying to be accusatory. Okay? And I I want to be cautious. But look at what Jesus said about the Spirit. This is in John 16. He, the Spirit, will glorify me because it is from me that he will receive what he will make known to you. Key point here, the Spirit in you will glorify Christ. The more of him exists in you, the less people will see you, notice you, point you out, and the more they will be giving glory to Christ. So, the logical question then, when your public embrace of the Spirit is drawing attention to you, and you know you've seen this before, people doing things or saying things or parading on stages claiming to be doing things in the name of the Holy Spirit, introducing themselves to attention, introducing themselves to profit and power and preeminence. And I'm not going to mention names, but you can know in your head what I'm talking about. When people are using the Holy Spirit for their own glorification, that is not of God. Because the Holy Spirit is not in the business of glorifying man. The Holy Spirit is in the business of glorifying Christ. So, by the way, this was going on in the Corinthian church, and Paul addressed it. Look at what he wrote. So if the whole church comes together, and everyone starts speaking in tongues, and inquirers or unbelievers come in, will they not say that you all are out of your mind? For God is not a God of disorder, but of peace. In other words, Paul's addressing this very abuse of the spirit that's going on. Christ was not being magnified in that church. Everybody was seeking the attention for themselves, and Paul rebukes it, and we should rebuke it too. The power of the Holy Spirit is for glorifying God. It's for glorifying Christ. This is why in Matthew 5, Jesus says these words to us. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may do what? See your good deeds and be amazed by you, be impressed by you, tell everybody how great you are and what you've done. No, they see your good deeds and they glorify my Father in heaven. That's why you seek the Holy Spirit in your life. If the Spirit of God is moving, God is going to be glorified. Go back to Pentecost. Do you remember after the the tongues descend on the disciples and and they go out and they start speaking in tongues and doing all of this and then Peter delivers uh, the message on the day of Pentecost? Do you suppose people walked away? Think about this. The people that were there that day, as they walk away, are they saying, man, Peter was amazing today. Did you hear that? I've heard him speak before. He's never spoken like that before. And by the way, did you see James? How he knew that African dialect and he was speaking it perfectly. How did he learn that so fast? James is amazing. Okay, you know that's not what they were saying. Those people could not be credited for what they were doing because it was supernatural in nature. Those people who were there that day knew this has to be God, and therefore God was glorified. Therefore, thousands were added to their number that day. Not the cult of Peter, but the church of Jesus Christ, because he was being glorified. When we unleash the Holy Spirit in our lives, it needs to be the exact same way. We will know if the Holy Spirit is moving here. We'll know if the Holy Spirit is moving in our lives If God is receiving the glory, not us. This is uh, what I was referring to earlier. The reason you have these supernatural gifts, so it is with you. Since you are eager for the gifts of the Spirit, try to excel in those that build up the church. You should be seeking the power of the Holy Spirit to serve the church. If you want to know the right reasons to seek the Holy Spirit, there it is. Because you have a desire to serve this body. That's why we receive those gifts. So, do me a favor. This will be awkward. Look around at the people right here. Just look around at each other. Everybody's uncomfortable looking at each other. Great. Dad, well done. That was good. Thank you. Good participation. My question is, do you desire to serve those people and help them? Do you honestly... You don't say it out loud. That would be awkward. Uh, not really. Don't say that. Okay? But do you desire to serve these people and help them? I'm going to be blunt and honest with you. I enjoyed the itinerant ministry that I did for several years. I really, really liked it. But I didn't even realize how much I was missing until these last few months. This is, so far, my favorite thing about doing this. Is that I now feel part of a local church, which is the... It's the design. It's what God set forth. I feel like I'm using my gifts to help people grow in their faith. 
That is a wonderful feeling. I've never experienced anything like it. I mean, I would just plop in and give a message that I give 10 times before, and I try to do it with, and I hope that people were impacted by it. But here, I feel like you're using your gifts, I'm using mine, and we're growing together as a body of believers. That's the way it's supposed to be. But not just with one or two people doing that. Imagine if we were all doing that, and you all were using your gifts to help us as a body of believers grow deeper. Do you desire that? Do you want to encourage them around you? Think about it this way. This is how I started thinking about it. God cares enough about me that he equipped all of you with spiritual gifts. The ones that I was mentioning last week. He gave Phil a voice so that when Phil sings, I, I'm transported to the throne, the throne room of God. He gave Sandra a gift of service so that she helps out when I need something done. She gave Linda a gift of encouragement so when I've been annoyed to no end by all of your children on a daily basis and I get home and I don't feel like working on the sermon for that week, I open up the mail and there's a card from Linda George that just makes my day. And, and re that's what I'm saying. God cares enough about me that he gifted all of you to help build me up. Do you not desire the same thing? Should we not desire the same thing? Doesn't that motivate us then to use our gifts to serve others? The, the same way that God has gifted them to serve us. Uh, the, to me, that's it. That's what, that's what the New Testament church was all about. You remember when we read those passages about how people brought everything that they made and they just laid it at the apostles' feet and said, give this to whoever needs it. They are loving each other and they're serving each other. Man, I just sold my field. I had a great harvest and, and here's all the money. I don't know who needs it, but make sure they get it. That is serving one another with the gifts that God gives you. And it's, do you not think that sets the church apart in the eyes of the world? People out there don't do that. Everybody's in it for themselves. Everybody wants to use their strengths and their abilities to glorify themselves. And here, it's not about us. It's about sending glory to, to God. I, to me, that sets it apart. Here's Paul in, in the first chapter of Philippians. Look at what he writes. He experienced this. I'm torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far than being with all of you folks. But it is more necessary, he writes, for you that I remain in the body. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and I will continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith. Now sometimes, I, I used to read that and think, Paul's a little cocky there, isn't he? I mean, it's better for you that I stay here instead of go to heaven. That's not what this is. Paul isn't full of himself. Paul is full of the Holy Spirit. And he recognizes that God has given him that gift. And because of that, God is wanting to use him to build up the people that he's around. And for that reason, he will set aside his own desire to go and be with Christ so that he can continue to serve. Even though he faces hardship, he will continue to serve because that's his, that's his purpose. To help others progress in the joy, in joy and in faith. That's it. And that should be our attitude as well. Of course, we would rather depart and be with Christ. Better by far. But you have the gift that you have, or the gifts that you have, to help us progress in joy and in faith. We often think that the Holy Spirit is going to come along and give us some super strength, make us a miracle worker. And there are so many people that interpret the Holy Spirit that way. That I want Him so that I can do things. And I can have that power just like the apostles had, but that's not it. The Holy Spirit will actually help you crucify your flesh and your, your sinful desires. It's an uphill climb, but you get supernatural legs to do it. Uh, that's what we were referencing last week. Now, all of that said, all of that said, um, I, I'm, I'm pointing out that the Holy Spirit helps you crucify your selfish flesh and your desires, but I also don't want to miss this. The Holy Spirit is called a gift for a reason. God doesn't give bad gifts. Not at all. I mean, not at all. So if he is called the gift of the Holy Spirit, then please understand there is a personal benefit for you to have the Holy Spirit. It's not all just about serving other people and, and, and it's like whack-a-mole, knocking yourself to the ground. That's not all that the Holy Spirit is. What is that personal benefit? Um, one of the things that we do a lot, we impose the failures of our earthly relationships on our relationship with the Father. What do I mean by that? An example of what I mean. We never felt secure in our marriage. We never felt secure in our relationships. And so because of that, we simply um, we push that off onto our relationship with Christ. We never feel secure in it. We wonder, am I really in? Is God going to erase my name from the book? And we have that fear. Or for some of you, um, 
and I won't tell you whether I struggled with this or not, um, our parents, they judged us based on our performance. We always felt like we had to attain their favor, and it was never good enough. Whatever we did was never good enough. Some of you lived that life, and so then you just, you, you just transport that over to your relationship with the Father, and you believe that God wants you to somehow prove your worth to him. And it's an entire life spent slaving away, trying to attain the favor of God. This is what I mean when we take the failures of our human relationships, and we put them onto the love of an unfailing God. Well, here's the benefit of the Holy Spirit. You ready for this? Woo, this gives me chills. The benefit of the Holy Spirit, when he is unleashed in your life, here's what you are guaranteed. Personally, this isn't about serving others. All right. This is all about you. This is what you get. You get a supernatural assurance of your salvation. When he is alive in you, you don't worry about, well, I hope I didn't miss anything in scripture and I end up getting the trap door to hell. You don't worry about those things. There is a supernatural assurance of your salvation that comes when the Holy Spirit lives in you. There is an intimacy with Christ. Some of you, I know, have said this and felt this. You have felt, I know that I should be more into Jesus than what I am. And I, you know, I try to discipline myself. I try to pray and do all of this. But I, I'm just not, there's something missing there. It's not missing when you have the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is one with Christ. He's one with the Father. So the more of him that is in you, the closer you will be to the Son and to the Father. An intimacy with Jesus is what you get with the Holy Spirit. A security in your relationship. You don't worry that you're going to tick off God and it's going to be all over for you. More on that in one second. And you get a confidence in the unfailing love of your heavenly father. These things, this is a personal benefit beyond imagination. You receive that when the Holy Spirit is alive in you. I think of it this way. As I've become a, a parent, I guess I didn't, so I, I mean, I, I am a parent. Um, as, as I've been a parent, I've learned the great challenge. One of the great challenges of parenthood. One of them is I want to encourage my child to be their best while at the same time assuring them that if they fall short, I'm not going to stop loving them. We had this happen just a, a few days ago, maybe it was a week ago. Jenny was driving the girls home from school, and she asked Bristol, who's in the back seat, how her day was. And Bristol said it was, and then she just lost it, just broke down, just in, which is normal for Bristol to be in tears like that. But Jenny said, oh, well, what happened? Well, come to find out, uh, this trauma was caused by Bristol missing a question on her spelling test. And uh, Bristol is a great speller, and we've told her that. She's a great speller. And so what do I expect? I expect her to do her best, which is to ace her spelling tests and, and to get the prize that comes along with getting all of her challenge words. And she does it week after week after week after week because the girl can spell. She can't do a lot else, but she can spell. That said, somewhere along the line, we didn't quite get the balance right because Bristol was worried. She said, you guys are going to be upset with me. I missed this word. I just didn't think about the second T. I, I don't know what it was. So somewhere we, we messed up a little bit in the formula, and she felt like if she fell or made a mistake, that suddenly we were, that's it, you're out of the family, it's done. Um, that's not the case. Now, by the way, sometimes as your kids get older, it, it's a little more serious. Um, you want to challenge them and let them know that you expect God's best for them when it comes to sexual purity. You want them to be sexually pure. You, you want them to know that is the expectation, that they follow God's standards of morality. But you also want to be sure that if they make a mistake and, and they become pregnant, that they're not going to hide that from you and go take care of the problem somewhere to try to hide. You want them to be able to come to you and tell you that this happened. So how do you find that balance? This is, to me, the great challenge of parenthood. Um, this is going to be weird because I'm not a LeBron James fan at all. You're not going to see me wearing LeBron James jerseys. But LeBron James, this super great NBA star, he coaches his son, who's like in junior high, his son's basketball team. Can you imagine the pressure of being LeBron James's son playing basketball and your dad is the coach of your team? So there's this, cameras always follow LeBron James around wherever he goes. And so he's coaching this game. His son misses a bunch of shots in this game, doesn't have a good game at all. And his son, afterwards, he's walking across the floor, his head is down, and he's really pouting, feeling sorry for himself, feeling like he let everybody down. And the cameras that have these distance microphones on them pick up the conversation that LeBron James has with his son. I want to show you this because this is exactly what I'm talking about the Holy Spirit will do in your life. Can we roll that clip? You may listen. Come sit down real quick. Wait a minute. Stop it. Stop it. Stop it. Stop it. Stop it. That's my fault. I'm just making sure you're awake, Mike. Stop it. Don't look at that. Stop it. All right. Good. 
I forgot to say, watch his face, watch the son's face from the beginning to the end of the clip, all right? Watch the face. That's all I needed to say. Roll it. You, was, you, 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 get, too, you get too down on yourself for no reason. You made three of the biggest plays of the game. You got the offensive rebound, right? Down four, you got the offensive rebound, got the tip in, right? And then you had the outlet pass to Owen when he got the and one. And then you made the last swing scene to him for the game winner. You know what I'm saying? So, like, if you're missing shots or making shots, don't worry about it, kid. Don't, you did a, you played a game. You ain't got to worry about making shots or missing shots. All right? Good job. I'm proud of you. I'm proud of you, man. All right, go with your team. Bye. Good job. That's what I'm talking about. Look, LeBron James contributed more to our civilization with that 50 seconds than all of the little balls that he's put through hoops in his entire career. That right there is a test of parenthood. The kid was distraught. He thought he was, he'd done all this terrible stuff. And the dad said, listen, you miss shots. Who cares if you miss shots? Look at all the things that you did right. And I'm still going to love you, even if you brick everything that you throw up there. That's what I'm saying. That is the assurance that the Holy Spirit brings. You fail, the Holy Spirit is there to say, listen, pick your head up. You are loved. You're loved by the Father. With his presence, we start serving God not as a nervous, guilt-ridden slave. We serve him as a loved child. And there is a profound difference between the two. Look at this from Galatians. Because you are his sons, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts. That's the spirit that cries out, Daddy. So you are no longer a slave, but God's child. And since you are his child, God has made you also an heir. I was talking to Jillian LaRue uh, this last week, and several of you know Jillian's story. I didn't ask if it was okay to talk about this, but I don't care. Um, I just don't. Um, several of you know Jillian's story. She was an orphaned child in China. Do you know the end result for an orphaned girl child in China? It's not good. And then come the LaRue's who fly over. I remember I was here. I just started teaching. They fly over to China and they adopt this girl and take her from what would have been, uh, who knows, and bring her here and the life that she's leading and living now. That's the intercession of love. That is taking a child that was going to have nothing and making them an heir to the LaRue great fortune. That is, I mean, that's what we all long for, is it not? But this, but this is what I'm saying. That's exactly, I mean, that's an earthly, and, and what the Faust did, the same thing. That's an earthly version of something that is unparalleled from an eternal perspective. That God took us, who have nothing, and he made us an heir to a kingdom that we can't even imagine. But that's the love of the Father, and that's who we serve, and we do it as a loved child. But now that you know God, or rather are known by God, how is it that you're still turning back to those weak and miserable forces? Do you wish to be enslaved by them all over again? If you find yourself going back to who you were before the Holy Spirit entered your life, if you find yourself being pulled towards those sinful desires, it is for this reason. You are not letting the Holy Spirit fill your life because the more of him that is in you, the less desire you will have to sin. If this is you, let me tell you to be on guard for a couple things. These couple things could be causing this, could be leading this way. Number one, you have too much comfort in your life. Too much comfort. Scripture tells us that we will experience the presence of the Holy Spirit when we are in desperate situations. This is how it's written. When you are brought before synagogues, rulers, and authorities, do not worry about how you'll defend yourself or what you will say. Why? Because the Holy Spirit will teach you at that time what you should say. You're under duress. You're in a bad situation. Don't worry about it. That's why you have the Holy Spirit. He is called the comforter. That's the words that Jesus uses. Okay? If he's the comforter... Can you tell me why do you need him if you're already comfortable? One of the reasons you may not be experiencing the gift of the Holy Spirit is because you're already comfortable. And so there's no need for a comforter. When Jesus assures us that the Spirit will be with us to the very end of the age, well, that's all well and good. But why do we care that he's with us if we never feel alone? Do you see what I'm saying? This maybe is a problem. If, you, if you're finding yourself drifting back, it's a lack of the Holy Spirit. Why is there a lack? Because you don't need the Holy Spirit. You are desperate for him. I was reading uh, in preparation for this message the story, and some of you may remember this in the news. In, in, back in tw uh, 2007, there were 23 missionaries that were taken captive by the military regime in Afghanistan. Uh, the, the, the radical Islamists, the, the Taliban in Afghanistan. For 41 days, they were held together, they were tortured, they were constantly being told that they were going to die for their faith. 
for 41 days. They had a Bible there, one Bible that had slipped by the guards and all of that, and they chopped it up into 23 pieces so that each one, when they were eventually isolated, would have their own portion of scripture that they could read. And when they were together and they would talk about it, they actually started arguing. Their last night together, they started arguing about who would get to be the first to be martyred for the, for the kingdom and get to see Jesus first. They were arguing about who was going to get to see Jesus first. There was a sense of peace and contentment in the worst situation imaginable. Well, enter the U.S. Navy SEALs, and they don't end up dying. Okay, So the, the U.S. Uh, government rescues them and brings them back to America, which seems like a good ending, and it is a good ending, particularly for the families. But these guys, uh, one of them that was writing this story said, I find myself haunted by this lagging thought that I've talked to others about. We've said, do you sometimes wish that we were still there? What? What? You are sitting in the lap of religious freedom where you can say and believe whatever you want to say and believe and you have a desire to be back in a place where your life was in danger and you were about to lose your life for the cause. What can explain that? One thing. Because the comfort they were getting from the Holy Spirit in that desperate situation blew away the comfort that comes from having religious freedom in a country like this. There is nothing man can do to emulate the comfort that comes, the supernatural comfort that comes from the Holy Spirit. If you're lacking him in your life, maybe it's a result of, of, of too much comfort. Second one is too much noise. Jenny and I have noticed this, too much noise in our lives. Um, we will go out to eat together, we'll be sitting there, and uh, there'll be a lull in the conversation. One of us will pull out the phone. Got to check what's going on, got to see if everybody's okay, and so we'll turn to the phones. And I don't think we're alone. Stop and ask yourself, when is the last time that you had an uninterrupted conversation with somebody? I'm serious. An uninterrupted conversation where you weren't distracted, you weren't looking around at other things. It was just you and them having a conversation. Can I remind you, Jesus didn't live in the era of social media, but that guy was always bombarded. People were always wanting a miracle. They were always wanting a teaching. They were at least following him around to see a miracle that might take place. And what did Jesus understand he needed to do? He understood that intimacy with the Father was vital. And so he would, he would go away. He would tell them to hang back and he'd go on ahead. One of my favorite things is when he would take a boat to the other side of the lake. Why did he do that? Because it would take them a lot of time to walk all the way around the lake and Jesus would have time on his own. He understood that. When he goes to the Garden of Gethsemane, he says, you guys wait here. I'm going to go over here and talk to the Father. Jesus understood and he was willing to separate himself and remove himself from people. And this is the Son of God. So why should we be any different regardless of your personality? Some of you, this will be really easy because you don't like people. So you like to separate yourself from people. And that's okay. Others of you are people persons. Or pers you're, pe you're people people. And that's fine and that's good. It's a spiritual discipline. But you have to remove yourself and it's worth it. How do I know that? Um, my wife just two weeks ago went on one of those spiritual retreats. Different churches have their different versions of it, but she was gone for the whole weekend, isolated from humanity, uh, no, no phones and stuff like that and all of that. And she was dreading it when she went. I can't be cut off from the world. I got to know if you're, I mean, you're in charge of the kids. I got to know, um, which I understand <laughs> is fine. It's totally fine. Um, we can rebuild that whole part of the house. But anyway, she, she was cut. When she came back, I have never seen her more interested in her relationship with Christ, more focused on doing devotions. I've never seen it before. And why? Because she had cut herself off from the noise and she was focused on that relationship. God doesn't give bad gifts. You want this gift. Look at this verse. But Christ has rescued us from the curse pronounced by the law. When he was hung on the cross, picture in your mind, when Jesus was hung on the cross, he took upon himself the curse for our wrongdoing. Why did he do that? So that we who are believers might receive the promised Holy Spirit through faith. Why did Jesus suffer that agonizing death? He suffered that agonizing death so that you could receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. That's why he did it. How dare we take that for granted? Listen, I don't know what your week looks like. But it's going to be one of these things. You're going to be driving to school. You're going to be going to work. You're going to be sitting in the office. You're going to be maybe starting your retirement. Congratulations. You're going to be facing a tragedy. Uh, you're going to be buying groceries. Some of you are going to go on a vacation. You're going to be make, making decisions. You're going to go to college. I don't know. But you're all going to lay down at night at some point. And whatever's going on in your life, be mindful of this. He lives in you. So speak to him. Know him. Experience him. 
Unleash him in your life and you will never again be the same. Father, I thank you for the gift of the Spirit. I pray that we would start this morning embracing him, understanding that you have given him to us for a reason and we want to seek him for the right reasons. Father, I don't know where everybody is this morning in their relationship with you, but I know that we could all use more of your spirit in our lives. So make that our prayer. And we ask it in the name above all other names, the name of Jesus. And everyone said, amen. Would you stand with me as we sing?